By request, I've decided to try improving a Keyshot file submitted by the viewers of this channel. And in the first episode of I Fix Your Renderings, we begin with an architectural lighting fixture submitted by a viewer named Alexi. So let's see what I'm up against and ultimately if I can fix this rendering. Okay, so before I make any changes to this Keyshot file, step number one is identifying our goal. And the person who submitted this uh, Keyshot file sent over this reference image on the right. This is a photograph of the real product. On the left, we see what is going on in their Keyshot file. So we're starting from a pretty good position. But when I asked the person what they wanted to do with this, what their goal was, they said photorealism. I'm going to assume that our goal is to make what they've got in Keyshot look closer to this reference photo. So I'm going to try to match this reference photo, and that's going to be our goal for this image today. Okay, so step number two is going to be to perform an audit. I'm going to audit this scene so we can have an understanding of what this person has done. Just in case there's anything weird going on, I want to be able to identify and fix that first before we jump into any of the detailed stuff. I can open my heads up display with H. I can see that it's not a particularly heavy scene. If we look at their scene tree, we've got a pretty simple model structure. I see a couple of physical planes they have in here. Uh, since they had those turned off, I will assume we're not using them and I will right click and do a lock so that those don't turn on. And then if we look, it seems like we only have one model set. So everything in our scene is visible right now, it seems. Just clicking through the scene tree, I'm looking for things like rounded edges here. It looks like we're not using any rounded edges, which might come into play in a little bit. If we look at our light, if I click it at the top, we can see the size. This seems to be to scale. It seems to be a reasonable scale. This is about a, I'm guessing like a four or five inch light. Uh, if we go into, check out just some of our materials, we've got some metals going on with some textures it looks like. Platinum, aluminum, we've got various roughness. We've got some cloudy plastic LED housing it looks like, some plastic. So their materials look pretty reasonable. Nothing too weird in there, I don't think. Let's check out our camera. So we have a locked camera, so if I try to navigate, it won't move. Um, I'm going to create a new camera from where their existing camera is, and we'll just leave it unlocked for now. Their existing camera, it looks like, was set to 50 millimeters. Um, no depth of field, okay. If we look at their environment, they've got a pretty simple looking environment right now. This is the three panels tilted or something like that. There's another one in here it looks like they might have used for a little bit, but the one that was active is the one that we're going to use as a starting point. So this is just a standard Keyshot HDRI. And then if we go to the lighting tab, we can see what lighting settings they've got going on. So 55 ray bounces is a lot. I'm going to call that overkill at this point. It's going to slow down the rendering process. So for me, I'm going to just throw this on product mode as our starting point. One thing you might have noticed is some of our transparent materials went black when we did that. That may be because we reduced the ray bounces. So that may be one reason they had them turned up. Sometimes some uh, weird artifacts can happen in there, depending on the geometry as well, uh, whether it's normals or tessellation. Um, but typically ray bounces uh, is going to be the setting that ensures that our transparent materials look the way they should. I will crank these up as we need to later on. But let's see if we can get the scene working well in product mode because that's going to give us a much faster render time. Already the noise is cleaning up quite a bit because of that. And then in our image tab, it looks like they did not make any changes. We've got a basic image style. So we'll just leave this as is. If you want to take the most direct path to learning Keyshot, then check out my Keyshot Rendering Masterclass. It's already helped hundreds of others level up, including designers from Nike, Dell, Logitech, Sonos, Garmin, Trek, Pepsi, and lots of others. See, I designed the Keyshot Rendering Masterclass to be the most comprehensive course available while still making it super easy to understand. And what makes it different is the unique combination of bite-sized feature-based videos coupled with follow-along project-based lessons. This course will help you build an intuitive understanding of how Keyshot works. Then you'll be able to create and explore within Keyshot without getting bogged down by the technical aspects of the software. My goal is to help you convert your ideas to digital images. When you enroll, you'll get access to over 100 video lessons, quizzes, an active comments section, private Discord server channel, and project files to maximize your learning. So check out the link in the description below to learn more. I hope to see you there. All right, so now I wanna take a look at the camera and composition of this scene. 
I can see that this person used 50 for a perspective value. That's Keyshot's default, nothing wrong with it, but I wanna get as close to the reference photo as we can. So I'm gonna to go to the image tab, create a new image style, go to photographic mode, and linear response curve. From here, we should have a layers option and underneath there, there's a front plate. I'm gonna drag the reference image right into that front plate file path and let go. And you should see it in front of the rendering. One warning is if your front plate aspect ratio is not the same as the real-time view, it's going to distort the front plate to match the real-time view. So you may want to make sure that your width and height here, it matches the aspect ratio essentially, in this case, square. Okay, so we have this slider option for opacity, which is cool. We can kind of use this to try to match up our camera angle, which really saves us a fair bit of time. But you might find out that there's some kind of mismatching going on with the sort of perspective here. So to make sure we have as close of a match as we can, I will increase this opacity to one. I'll go to the camera tab and we're gonna use this match perspective tool. When I click on this, you get these funky colored lines. The way these are used is we're going to choose a plane or ideally a box, a three-dimensional object, and we're going to align the X, Z, and Y lines with that box in order to try to figure out or reverse engineer this perspective. If the color is confusing, look at the bottom left of our screen. We've got this X, Y, Z coordinate. You can hit Z on the keyboard to bring that up. So the Y lines are uh, corresponding with a vertical and the Z blue and the X red, and we want to kind of align these with this, this object here. The longer the lines are and the closer, the more accurately lined up they are with your object, the more accurate your results or the perspective that Keyshot figures out or calculates will be. It's not gonna be perfect. You know, we're going for a ballpark here. So this is telling me about 55. I think that's probably about accurate. If I go ahead and hit the screen checkbox, let's go and back to our image, drop the opacity. So we've set the perspective at 55. Now I just need to rotate my camera so my light here more or less lines up with the reference photo. And it's not gonna be perfect. You gotta remember that camera lenses, they have different types of distortion that, that's gonna happen. And the way the image is processed, it's, it's gonna be a little bit different. It's not gonna be truly perfect here for what we can get in Keyshot, but this is really close. I'm happy with this. So from here, I will turn off that front plate, pop into my camera tab and make sure I save this. Now this camera's position is locked. Well, it's not locked, but it's saved. I did recall seeing a little bit of depth of field on our reference photo. What that means is this leading edge is blurry. It's blurry back here, but it's sharp somewhere in the middle. We can go to our camera tab and we can turn on depth of field and we can set the focal point. Click this little crosshairs, click on your model where you want to be in focus. And we can increase the f-stop to try to bring more of the image in focus. We'll try something like 10, maybe 20, 25. I don't want it to be too strong because it might make some of my details kind of blur out. So I think this will be just enough to give us a little bit of a hint of a kind of a realistic looking depth of field. So I'll save that. And finally, for those of you on a computer that maybe is a little underpowered, it struggles to work and update quickly with depth of field, you can always create a new camera and then just turn off depth of field and you could save this one and rename it N O D O F. So we know it's no depth of field. Then maybe we name this one uh, D O F render. So we know, so we can work in the no depth of field, but then when we're ready to render, we can make sure this one's active. Totally up to you. Okay, so I've rearranged my key shot workspace so we can talk about lighting. I've got the reference image on the left and a real time right here in the middle. I wanna try to get this to match what we see on the left a little bit better. Now, when I go to the environment tab, I think we can recreate the lighting we see here just using the HDRI editor. And I wanna create a new blank environment map. Now I'll look at the image on the left and we're gonna to try to match the light that we see here. Our background is all bright white, which is a little distracting. So let's go to the settings. And that's because we're in color mode right now. Let's go to lighting environment. And now this will just show us the HDRI we're working on. Back in the HDRI editor, I will click this button to add a pin. And to place it, I just need to click on the surface I want it to reflect off of. So if we see a highlight here on the upper left of these bolts, I will click there in my model and our light should be positioned accordingly. And close enough. And then I'll hit done. I'm gonna change the fall off mode to exponential. It'll be a little bit more realistic. And it gets darker, so we need to brighten it to compensate. 
So four looks pretty good. Uh, there's also a highlight on the side here. Let's go ahead and create a new pin for that. I will click to place, and I'm gonna do the same thing. We're gonna go right down to exponential, and I'm gonna scale this one down a lot. So I mainly want it smaller because I don't want this highlight that we're seeing in the middle here illuminating as much of the rest of the model. So that's pretty good. Maybe you wanna make it a little brighter. I'll go down a bit, maybe go to eight for the size and brightness, maybe like three, four. All right, now the other thing I'm seeing is a little bit of a highlight reflection up the upper left-hand corner here. So let's make one more pin and I'll click right about here. Now this one's way too big, so I wanna scale it down, but I actually wanna to go to change the fall off quite a bit, which will make it very soft. And I can go ahead and make this exponential as well. Now it's very hard to see, so maybe we go a little brighter and maybe a bit smaller. I think that's pretty good for now. Now what I wanna do is tackle the background. So you'll notice that in the reference photo, we're on like kind of like a white papery sort of a background. And here we're floating in a gray void. So let's fix that. Let's go to our settings. And now we'll go back to that background color mode um, when we click this button. And the background goes white, but now it's too bright and we need some sort of shadows and stuff like that. What we wanna do is take the color and actually color pick the color we want the background to be. So I'll actually click on the reference photo and this gets us pretty close, this is cool. Maybe I wanna darken it just a little bit. That's looking pretty good. And what about our shadows? Well, there's a ground section. It looks like this person turned off ground shadows. I'm gonna turn them back on. And now we see our shadows are pretty much matching the reference photo that tells us our lights are in the right position, more or less. But I'm also seeing some extra like this model looks just pretty dark overall. And what we can do is we can go to our HDRI editor and we can either change the color of the background, which is just a gray right now, or we could get some variation in it using like a gradient. Now this obviously gives us a lot more light in our scene, but I think this comes with a couple benefits here too. So we have white on the right, which gives us a bright ceiling. That's where lights are normally located. And then we have black on the floor. So if we drag this toward the middle, we bring up some of those dark reflections here, but we can also add another color stop by double clicking here, and we can brighten this stop too. So what I'm doing here is, is introducing a gradient in order to give us some gradient reflections on the metal here. Because metal is so reflective, it helps to have a little bit uh, more going on in our environment, so there's some variation in the reflections here. So this is where I'm gonna take a little bit of creative license, if you will, to kind of design this a little bit, if that makes sense. So we can go and play with our lighting here, maybe make the ceiling a little less bright, and maybe we want a little bit more brightness here in the middle, not appear black. Now we don't wanna make it too bright because if we don't have any dark areas to reflect, it's just gonna be washed out in gray. We can also take the overall brightness of this environment and just increase it and see what happens. Uh, at this point, I want to, if I can, improve upon the image, not just match the reference photo, but see if we can't make it even a little stronger than the reference photo. So some additional highlights here and there might benefit us, I think. Overall, we're looking pretty good. I think it's still a little bit dull over here. Also, I noticed there's a bit of a bright spot behind our light here. And I think we can introduce some more interesting lighting. If I recall, this person had a couple of planes in here. I'm curious to see if I unlock one of these and turn it on, let's see what happens. Yep. <laughs> okay, so they tried to put a light in here somewhere to kind of match this sort of backlit thing. I think it's a good start. I'm gonna hit O to open the geometry view, which I've positioned off to the side here. Um, and then we can see the plane. This is their physical light. So let's go ahead and move that. I think we just need to finesse its uh, position and its size. So it, first of all, it's too close. Let's move it further away. And second of all, let's make it bigger because it's casting a sharp shadow. We don't want a sharp shadow. Our reference photo does not have sharp shadows. So I want this light source to be very big. So it's kind of just like a fill light. Uh, and then about its position, I think I want it more over to the side, more toward the center of the photo or rendering. It's looking pretty good. Maybe we can kind of tilt it down a bit. 
So it's filling in this area and we'll hit okay. I think it's also a little too yellow. I'm gonna double click on it and just kind of cool it off a little bit. It can still be a little bit warm, but I think that's better, definitely. I noticed the temperature of some of our other lights too are a little cool. We can adjust that either on a per pin basis. So like I could come in and take one of these pins, maybe warm it up if we wanted to. I could go to Kelvin, maybe warm it up. The downside to doing this is it darkens the pin quite a bit. So now we need to go brighter, but still that's pretty helpful. All right, the last thing I wanna do is there's still a little bit more light on the lower left-hand side of this that I wanna incorporate. So if we go back into our HDRI editor and I add one more pin, I think I wanna hit this somewhere down on the side over here, maybe even over here. I'll scale this guy down. We definitely don't want it bright. Let's go to exponential, make it pretty small. And I don't even think I want it that. Let's go about five, maybe eight. And then because this is kind of filling this in, we can also take that background and make this guy a little bit darker as well if we wanted to. Just to make sure we have plenty of contrast in our lighting. Okay, and then of course, while we're on the subject of lighting, materials and how shiny they are play a big role in how the lighting looks. So I don't wanna go further with the lighting here because matching this may come down to making some of this metal a little bit shinier here. I'm not entirely sure but we'll cover that when we talk about materials. Okay, so this is the part where we talk about materials. There's a lot of things I do before materials and now we're ready. I think what I'm seeing in the reference is some shinier metal than they have in here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this piece here. So it is a metal material measured, platinum preset, roughness, and probably some textures. So let's get into the material graph. Huh, okay, this is a little bit weird. So we have our metal and I, I expected to see the brush. We can see the brush texture. That's that's not very weird, but um, what is a little weird is this contour. I'm not sure I understand why this is here. Let me explain. So, so this is weird. Okay, so this is almost like a tune material and it's drawing a line on the edges, but it's plugged into opacity, which means the black parts are gonna disappear. So if I'm not mistaken, what this texture is doing is it's literally making the edge of this model invisible, which doesn't make any sense because typically we want the metal to reflect light. And if we're making the edge disappear, it's gonna look like a broken model. So I'm gonna delete that. Now maybe this person was using it for something else, I don't know, but it would appear if I disable this, it would appear like this this uh, is, is like broken into pieces. I don't know if this, it doesn't look like it's stitched together very well. Let's do a quick experiment. Let's take this metal. I'm just gonna, platinum's fine, but let's just make it zero for shininess. And now that edge, uh, again, I'm not sure what's going on with that edge, but let's let's see if we can use the rounded edges tool to kind of round this edge off a little bit. So selecting this from the scene tree, if I go ahead and find the rounded edges and type in 0.1, that's what I'm afraid of. It doesn't seem like it's really behaving correctly. Normally you would get a rounded edge there, one. See, it's not working. It's like, I don't know if it's a bug or what. Um, let me try something else real quick to see if that tool will work. I'm gonna try edit normals, try calculate the normals. Doesn't look like metal anymore, that's a weird one. Let's go to tools and then retessellate. So this is working, it seems. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Let's just try this. Now, will it take the rounded edges? Aha, ladies and gentlemen, yes. So, okay, a couple weird things. This is what happens. Sometimes you get distracted and one thing leads to another. Now, what I don't understand is why rounded edges was not working. The edit normals didn't help, but retessellating did. And by doing this, now I can add say a 0.2 millimeter rounded edge and it's gonna give us something to reflect light and that's really going to make this look a little more three dimensional. Now that's a little too high. Let's go to a smaller, like a 0.1 or a 0.2. 
And honestly, like the same procedure should apply to pretty much everything in the model. So I don't know if I need to do a retessellate um, on all of them, but let's just try this other one real quick. I think I did point five. Apply. Now this guy is working. So again, I'm not sure if you can see that on your computer, but that little highlight we're getting here now is really going to help describe the form of this. Now this person, I think they said that this is a SolidWorks model. So it should have imported fine, but it seems like there's some weirdness going on. If we look at the screw, this also has a really sharp edge, but if I try it, let's see if I try the rounded edges. It doesn't seem to be working. So let's try doing the same thing here. I might just need to retestlate a bunch of these. In fact, I'm gonna go and retestlate as many of these as I need to, and we'll fast forward over that part. Okay, so after retestlating those parts, I should now be able to apply a rounded edges to nearly everything in here. So I can hold control and multi-select these objects. And let's try with these screws first to do something like a 0.2 rounded edge. And right there, I'm now reflecting light on the edges of those bolts. It's bringing this to life in ways that we couldn't imagine when they had sharp edges. Let's go ahead and grab this guy, make sure he's got a rounded edge too. And that just brings that leading edge out so nicely, it makes a huge difference. I'll try on this piece here, maybe a smaller 0.1, maybe a 0.2. This will help, especially in parting lines and stuff like that. We're getting some highlights picked up in there. Same with this acrylic piece. Let's try a 0.2. And that brings out that refraction in there hugely. Makes a huge difference. And then this piece right up here. Try a 0.2. Okay, so now that we're using our rounded edges properly, this should help things fall into place and make them look a lot more convincing. Now remember, I disabled our texture over on this leg, or whatever it's called, sorry. Uh, if I enable it now, this should bring that texture back. And I think it's a little bit strong. Let's go in and, and adjust this. Box mapping's okay since we don't want to un UV unwrap this, but I think we can improve this. Let's take the length and make it something like a eight, so longer brushing. And I think right now the bump is just too strong. It's set to two. Let's try one. We want the bump to actually be quite small. Let's try uh, 0.5 or maybe even smaller, 0.2. And what we want to do more so than bump is maybe use this on the roughness a little bit. So I'll plug this into roughness. That's gonna make a big difference. We're gonna go ahead and use the color to number and we're going to darken this. So if I preview that with C, we wanna bring this, make it, the whole thing a lot darker and that's gonna make it shinier. So we should get a little bit of roughness, but it should also be in the uh, direction of the brushing, which should help a lot. So we'll go down to point 0.1, and then we bring the output from point 0.01 maybe, and then maybe the brushing is just a little too long. I had it set to eight, let's try six. That's looking a little bit better. It's still standing out and pretty noticeable. I'm gonna back down the reflection a little bit, point 0.05 maybe. That's looking a lot better, okay. So I just had it too shiny. Overall, we may need to, now that we're getting more reflection, we may need to go in this environment, grab that uh, background, remember, and we can darken this up as needed. Maybe that pin that we added at the end, maybe that's a little too bright too. Maybe I can just turn it off. There we go, okay. I was wondering where that pin was. Here it is. So what I wanna do is just really darken this. So right now it's, uh, brightness of one, let's try 0.5. I think that's pretty good. It's a lot better. And we're a little bit too shiny perhaps here, over here it looks like. And these are linked. So that's telling me that maybe we need to pop in here one more time, take this up a little bit. So instead of 0 0.05, we'll go to 0 0.075. And what we're looking to do is to have this part over here a little bit less shiny. thinking that looks a lot better. And that's probably gonna make this side here a little bit smoother as well. All right, so now we're looking pretty good. I'm gonna copy paste this. So shift left click, shift right click, 
to link it onto this other piece and this becomes just a little bit more reflective, a little more shiny. I'm gonna darken this just a touch. So 0 0.03 and 0 0.1. I think that just matches that a little bit better. And also the metal may be just a little bit too bright. So it's a platinum. We can actually just choose color and we can just bring this down to whatever color. Maybe we want a little bit of warmth in there. Color matching is not my strong suit, but I think overall this will probably help. Okay, and I will go ahead and use that same material. Shift left click, shift right click. I'll use it on the side here and the top. And now of course that makes it far more reflective. <laughs> this is the push and pull that happens when we get into materials. So right now, I don't know if on the reference we have brushing, it looks like we might, but maybe it's more subtle. So maybe I need to scale this brushing down. Let's go to our pattern and let's go down to or our texture. Let's take it down to 0.5 millimeters. It still seems to be a little bit short to me. Let's take that length up to 10. And I think our contrast is still too much within our color to number. So I'll take this up to 0.05. I'll bring this down to 0 0.08. The thing with textures, especially with metal, is they need to be subtle, otherwise they'll look artificial. They won't look real. So I think this is looking pretty good. Now we have some vertical brushing here, which probably is not correct. So maybe we can uh, select this material and unlink it. Go to our textures, and then maybe we can just rotate it 90 degrees. So now hopefully our brushing is going along with the part, not up and down. That should look a lot better. And lastly, I've got a bit of a highlight here that I think is still too distracting. So in the environment is that it's one of these pins here. There it is. Let's just dial this one back a little bit. So 0.75, there we go. And then I th think this leading edge here, this highlight is too bright. So I'm bring this down. And then this edge here is too bright, and you'll see what I'm doing here in a second. I know it's looking more flat and more gray, but once we've done all that, we can proportionally bring the whole brightness of the entire environment up. So let's take this up to like a two. Now everything gets brightened together, and it looks just more balanced overall. And I think we can still go in and take this uh, pin right here, dial it back a little bit. All right, thanks for hanging in there. We're getting close. We're almost done with this. The last thing we need to do, the elephant in the room, as it were, is to indeed adjust this central area. So the first thing I wanna do is check out this acrylic looking piece. They have a cloudy plastic for this. I can try this. Let's make it quite cloudy, like maybe 0.9. Now, one thing they've done is made the transparency distance really high. I don't think it needs to be quite so high. If we reduce this, let's see, let's try 50. It gets cloudier, right? So we can maybe even bring that down further and then we don't need as much cloudiness. So maybe 20. And then we take the cloudiness back down. This is probably only a couple millimeters thick is my guess. So if we select it, it is three millimeters thick. So if we go back to that material, we could set this to three for the, for the transparency distance. And it looks like they got a little bit of blue in there. Uh, I don't know in real life if it's supposed to be blue. I think to me, I'm seeing a little bit more yellow. We'll, we'll leave the color out of it for now. But by making the cloudiness a little bit higher, we get to take and blur some of these refractions. We also want to make the outer surface a little rough. I can definitely see that it's got some roughness. So if we take our roughness up to say 0 0.05, and what about our rounded edges? Maybe they need to go up a little bit. Now, if we're not sure, what that's looking like, I can draw a little region render with Control Shift R around that section. And what we're trying to do is get the same appearance, the same frosty appearance. I think it's looking pretty good overall. Control Shift R to get out of that. Now, what about these pieces up top? I think they should get a pretty similar material. So I'll hit Shift left click to copy this, Control Shift right click to paste it unlinked to these pieces here. And these are going to need more cloudiness, I think. Probably more like a point five or something or 0.6. And of course the lights are turned off. So if we hide this with uh, control, alt, left click, 
And here, let's see what we have. We have a plastic down here and we have these little lights. Let's take a look at this plastic here. So that's the PCB, okay? We have a glass in here, which I think that's going to make things a little bit complicated. Uh, let me see about hiding that and then just turn on, turn these plastic lights into um, actual lights. We'll make them point lights. So a point light shoots light in every direction. We're gonna make them really dull, like a power of one. Maybe even that's too bright, point one. And then what we'll do is turn on the part that we hid just a little bit ago. And let's see how the light comes through there. It's a little bit dark, so we'll need to brighten those lights. 0.5 maybe. I think for now too, that glass part, let's make them all the same cloudy plastic. So shift left click on this. Let's hide this piece. We'll turn on this part and shift right click to link that. Now, interestingly enough, that changed what we see underneath here and I don't like that. So I'm gonna hit control Z. So maybe we'll just leave that as it is and we will right click show all parts and I'm gonna draw a region render around these to speed things up and let's see how these lights look. All right, so this is really noisy and really slow. If I hit H on my keyboard, I bring up the heads up display. We're sitting at 12 frames a second I'm only using half my CPU, but that's still very slow. So I'm gonna go to this glass piece and turn it off, see if that helps. So that brings it up to 17 frames a second, and I don't visually see any major change in here. By hiding the glass, we're basically just simplifying the structure. And then the other thing that we can do is see if we can address some of this noise by going to the image tab. And then we wanna go down to denoise Turn this checkbox on, and of course it blurs everything out. Let's take the denoise blend off and set the Firefly filter to 0.5, and that gets rid of a lot of the noise that you see there. And then the denoise will set this at like 0.2 or something like that. That'll soften the image a bit. The only time I don't like using this is when it makes some of your textures kind of disappear. A couple things I wanna do before we call this one quits is I wanna take this cloudy plastic material and make a little cloudier, so maybe 0.7. And it's probably just going to illuminate these a little bit more. Maybe I wanna make this bottom piece just a touch less cloudy, so maybe 0.15. I'm thinking this piece has maybe like a little bit of yellow in it. And maybe that's too yellow, and if that's the case, I can increase this value to 10, in which case I'm gonna to wanna to bring this cloudiness probably back up to 0.2. All right, at this point, I'm gonna call the materials done. The last thing we need to do is a couple of final touches and then we can render. Now, before we call this completely done, I'm just gonna look at a couple more settings. I wanna to go to the image tab and we went into something called a linear response curve earlier. In this case, we're getting a lot of white blown out areas. Now that's pretty accurate when we look at the reference image, but maybe we don't want it quite so bright we could look at what say the high contrast or the low contrast response curve looks like. We're looking very comparable or close to the reference, which is pretty nice. Now we can play with it a little bit and I think this is overall too dark. So I wanna bring up this exposure a little bit and we can take up the contrast, maybe a touch, trying to match a reference more or less. Now those lights can go brighter for sure. So if we go back in here by increasing the brightness of these, we should get more light coming out of them without it making the image overall too ugly and white. Let's try 1.5. This is a little light indicator to make it go away. I have to uh, deselect the object by clicking in the background. And what's great is you can just keep pushing the value of those lights further and further without overexposing anything. Let's try three. I think at that point we're looking pretty good Maybe we're a little too cloudy here. I'm gonna bring the cloudiness down a little bit because I wanna see a little bit more transparency in this material. You can also play with the scattering directionality to see if that gives us more of what we want. I think forward scattering like this is getting closer to matching the photo, which is good. All right, overall, I think that's pretty good. If we go to our image styles and we take our white balance, if we go right, it makes it bluish. If we go left, it makes it warmer. And this image is definitely a little bit warmer. I think I want my contrast to go up a little bit more too. Maybe in my lighting here, on my HDRI can go up a little bit on the contrast. Maybe I'll reduce the contrast here a little bit now. 
And overall, it's a little dark underneath here, so maybe in my environment, I need to bounce a little more light up in here. So I can go in the HDRI editor, maybe brighten this a little bit. But I don't wanna to lose too much of that contrast we had. Now let's go and refresh that HDRI. If we want, we can set it to a 10K. That'll just give us a little bit better results in our reflections. And then finally, we can, if we want, we can play with the curve. I, I don't think we need to. We can play with bloom since there is a light source in here. If we turn on the bloom, we can make this glow, make the bloom radius big. This will make everything fuzzy. But what we can do is increase the bloom threshold. So only the areas that are really bright are getting the glow effect. So we're mostly just getting it where those lights are. We can maybe even increase this a bit and bring this down a bit. Still a little bit much. I still think we're a little bit bright on the side down here. So let's fix that. Sorry, I'm nitpicking a little bit. I do like this pin, but it just may be a little bit much. Maybe the background light needs to be a little bit brighter. So we'll go to this plane here and we'll darken the background of our HDRI. Maybe we'll brighten it a bit. And I know it's choosing a bit of a green, but I think a little bit more of a warmer tone would be a little better. Add a teeny bit of a vignette if we want. Like a teeny bit, not, a, not much. All right, the last thing we need to do is determine our render settings. And I'm pretty happy with how this looks. If I go to the lighting tab, the original person who sent this over had this set to 55 ray bounces. I think everything else was the same here. Now, 55 ray bounces ensures that we get lots of scattered bounce light within this plastic assembly, and it looks really good, don't get me wrong, but it actually looks brighter than I'm seeing in the reference photo, and because it's gonna take longer to render, I don't think we need that many ray bounces. Just the product mode preset looks pretty close to what I'm looking for, what I want. Maybe these are a little darker, in these areas, these refractions. So I could take my ray bounces from 14, maybe up to 20, and that should brighten those up considerably and still not take quite as long to render as it would with 50 ray bounces. So I think I'm gonna leave this where it's at. Now, normally when using light that's transmitting through a plastic or a lens, I would turn on caustics, but in this scene, it's really not terribly necessary and it's going to slow things down even further. I say it's not necessary because when I turn it on, I'm not getting any results out of this that I like or want. It may be a little more accurate. It may be illuminating these a little bit better, but I'm going based on this reference image. And when I turn off caustics, it just looks the way I want. So I'm not gonna render with it. All right, so I'll go ahead and quickly save this, create a region render, control shift R. And this is going to tell me how many samples I need to render out to. Now. The number is going to be very high. There's no way around that. When using metals and fairly shiny materials and cloudy plastics and physical lights, this scene is almost a worst case scenario when it comes to getting rid of noise. You can use a little region render like this and see how long it takes for this to start to clean up. Keep an eye on these samples up here. For example, if our samples say 200 and you don't see any more noise or fireflies here, then that's the number you're gonna to render to. But in this case, I know for a fact, I'm gonna to have to go considerably higher than that. I can increase my core count for a bit to see if I can speed that up. But I'm basically gonna wait here and see how long this takes to get a little bit more cleaned up. Now to set my render settings, I will go down to the render button. I wanna render this out as something with 32 bit depth because of all this bright light in here. I'm gonna probably make a couple tweaks here in, uh, in Photoshop when I'm done with this just to ensure that I have the right exposure of everything. And I can get that using EXR or Photoshop 32 bit. The only time I really go with Photoshop uh, format is if I'm gonna render out additional uh, layers or passes, anything like that. So maybe I'll go with a 32 bit Photoshop file. And then I wanna click add to PSD. And I'll go ahead and click on the clown pass and probably a normals pass. I think that's it. So. For my render settings, this is where it's gonna get really ugly. I could probably get away with maybe a thousand samples, but I'm not in a hurry and I really wanna clean rendering. So I'm gonna go ahead and try rendering this a little higher, maybe 1500 samples. One thing that can help with that, I forgot to mention, is taking up the material that's noisy. So the roughness here, 
Let's set this to 24 samples. The cloudy plastic, let's also make sure that we have samples set a little higher, 24. And the cloudy plastic in here, 24 as well. So anything where we're getting some extra noise, by adding some higher uh, material samples, this should help them be a little less noisy at the time of render. Also, these wires are dangerously close to the edge of my image here. I think I'm just gonna move the camera on over to create some breathing room there, just to be safe. Go ahead and save that camera. Actually, we want the depth of field one, don't we? Let's move that on over. And that was such a small move, I'm not worried about that interrupting my depth of field, but just to be safe, I can make sure it's still set where I want it. And if you're really paranoid, you can open the geometry view and you can see what part of the product is indeed in focus. We can increase this if we want. Maybe go 30, 35 maybe, 40. And we can move this a little further out, 300. I think that looks pretty good to me. We'll go ahead and close this up. Save that camera, double check all of our render settings. Looks good to me, I'm gonna go ahead and render and I will check back in with you when all is said and done. Time to take a look at our results. So here's Alexi's rendering straight out of Keyshot, a pretty good starting point. And here's my rendering straight out of Keyshot without any post. Now to take my rendering one step further, I did some color correction, sharpening, and added some smudges and imperfections inside of Photoshop. And here's the result of that. And here we have my final rendering next to the photo reference Alexi provided us with. As you can see, there's really no magic shortcut. Lots of small changes led to the results we got. So what do you think? Was I successful in improving upon this Keyshot file? 